Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi. Got to get worked out. So I'm glad. So you, Claudia, you used the same link as you did before? Yes, I did. Oh, perfect. Excellent. I feel like we haven't seen each other at all forever. Oh, let's see here. No chance. No chance. All right, my mother-in-law just found a box of DVDs of old Korean dramas that she's decided to start watching. And if you don't know, I'm killing time here. The basic plot of any Korean drama is uh, two people that like the same person and that one person has to pick one of those two. And it's usually hijinks involved in who likes who, how much and what they do. At least that's of all the Korean dramas I've been forced to watch. Claudia, have you watched a lot of Korean dramas? You know, hilariously enough, I have never actually sat down to watch one, even though like I'm always hearing about a lot, especially from my grandmother. Uh, yeah. She actually lives in Korea now with her partner. Um, yeah, but just a lot of the ones she suggested, like yeah, I actually might end up checking out because they sounded really interesting. Like I don't know if they're horror K dramas, but yeah. Hmm. And I've so, seen like some clips here and there, and they look funny too. Well, the problem is that my wife and I share my Netflix profile, which totally sucks because <laughs> now like all of my suggestions are like Korean dramas. And I'm like, Korean. dude, is that oh, my, my area of interest? No. What about you, Cody? Have you watched a lot of Korean dramas in your time? Fortunately, I have not. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that. I, I've my seen my, my grandma watches a lot. So exactly, thought, it's all grandmothers, exactly. <laughs> I see that, Pierce. Yeah. No, don't touch that. I think one of the most random clips I've seen from a K-drama was like this elderly lady slapped a guy with like a bag of kimchi. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, the thing I always find so interesting is the very few parts of it where they address uh, North Korea, um, right? And they, because like in one of them, it was like a refugee from North Korea that came to South. And then there were two girls that like that one guy that came from the North Korea. It was like called the like, Hello, Mr. Kim, or something like that, and I, I found it interesting. Um, I think though, it starts to spread off into propaganda, right? Just as you would expect from something where, right? I mean, obviously, if you live in the South, you're like everything anti-North. And then in this documentary I saw about North Korea, the one thing they really want is um, people to smuggle. USB drives with Korean dramas on it so they can put it on their computer and then watch the South Korean dramas. So, go figure. I Have you seen um, any like Bollywood dramas? No, you know, I've actually never, I haven't been exposed to them enough. Actually, my only I, so I've actually, you, you that's you. right, Pierce. I haven't actually seen any um, Bollywood movies. The only thing I've seen that's supposed to be inspired by it is uh, the Wes Anderson um, Darjeeling Limited. Have you seen that? No, I've heard of that, though. Uh, it's pretty great. I mean, I like the movie quite a bit, and it's supposed to be inspired by, like, old like 1970s 1980s bollywood bollywood's pretty insane it is no it yeah. really is yeah. their cgi is uh they do not try to make it real <laughs> oh you know what though that would make sense because i guess the movie i saw the hollywood ish version 
of a Bollywoodish kind of movie was what was that one where the lion or the tiger was in the same boat as that guy? Life of Pi. Dies. What? Life of Pi. Yeah, yeah. Is that supposed yeah. to be Bollywoodish? I don't think so. Oh. I don't think well, so. it really is a whole bunch of CG though. That's yeah. really unbelievable. Yeah, you. Uh, there's a subreddit um, on Reddit called yeah. Bollywood Realism, yeah. where they just make fun of all the all the clips within Bollywood. <laughs> you should yeah. give it a try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to now find the movies that I like to watch again because my <laughs> wife has taken over all of the um, because she's taken over all of the uh, Netflix um, suggestions. Now I have to like wade through everything. And so like things that I normally would like to watch, like, um, let's see, what would be something like I would watch? Like, I like like non, so I'm the kind of person that when I work, I have to have something on in the background so my mind doesn't wander, right? But I'm not like paying attention to it, right? Yeah, so like okay. a perfect show would be like, you know, a couple fighting over a household renovation right because like you totally do not need to be engaged in it to yeah. know what the recipe is right there's a perfectionist who wants like an open format right like and yeah, then there's another okay. one who wants like a class you know like a historic brick building with original plumbing right and so you already know they're gonna like you know complain about everything and right you don't have to be engaged in watching it like you know there's going to be a pipe that bursts there's going to be a wall they shouldn't have knocked down but got knocked down they're going to have a price overrun and then they're going to sell it for three times what they paid for it right i mean we already know what the recipe is and they're going to make up in the end yeah exactly 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 as money would make them all work out to have it done Let's see. We've only got, dude, we've only got four people. That really sucks. Um, <laughs> wait for three more minutes here. Um, otherwise, I'll start lecturing. Um, I'll update everyone right now. I sort of worked through the very beginnings of the exam, most of the exam at this point, um, so that you all have an idea of how I structured the exam. Um, I structure the exam so that it's um, a bit more difficult than the assignments, but there's not, um, the scores don't mean as much as they would in a, um, uh, like a 100 level course. Sorry, my son's just, I mean, I guess when you're two, right? I mean, the whole world is fantastic because you've learned how to talk. So my apologies about his excitement about the act of talking. Um, so, um, it, my memory serves me right, and this I could really be off, um, but it shows you how little importance I place on the scores. Um, so I've created an answer key for the short answer. When I look at the multiple choice, the multiple choice looked like the class average was like, I want to say 60% on the multiple choice. So if you did the multiple choice and you're like, damn, I'm dumb. Right, that was totally fine feeling to have. It's not something to worry about at all because now what I do is now uh, I, it per uses my perfection of the art of reading your short answers. Sorry, my son needs help getting a book off the bookshelf. And as a what book do you want, buddy? You want this book? Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, this is a good book. The book, so all everyone can see it, is called. How science works. Well, you guys can't see it because it's, I've got the fake background here. And I've also got cars and trucks and things that go. And happy Halloween, Curious George. Okay. Um, what I was saying is that now it perfects my art of reading your short answers and getting a sense of what you really know, like how well you understand the material. And that's kind of the fun part for me. If you are in a situation where 
your multiple choice looks really bad and your short answer look really bad, but I get a sense that you know more than what is reflected there. That would be when I will then um, give you something else to do to kind of boost that score. Plus you'll have hopefully your completion of the Bloomberg market concepts to also boost your score a little bit, if that makes sense. Uh, Cody, I'm not worried about you because you and I have had class before. What about you, Chance? Does that sound, does that make you worry less? Uh, I, I think so. Or were you not worried before? I mean, I did have some questions about um, like one, there was this one question in the test um, and I got the answer from like the textbook. Mm -hmm. And it was wrong, so I I was just gonna ask you like later. I'm I'm gonna find it in the textbook so I can like okay. page. Yeah, it, but when you see the score like, again, don't like freak out because none of the short answers are graded, and that's now on yeah, me to yeah. kind of go through that. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the short answers. And I was like, yeah, he'll, I know he'll grade that later. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. The multiple choice. So I was like, wait, what? I thought I read this in like chapter whatever. Yeah, no, it, it, it could be that I, because I, you know, what I do is exactly what you did, which is I look through the book and I make questions. Um, but I totally, right, like when I have to make the exam, you saw like I posted it kind of like close to the deadline of when I should have posted it, right? And so I do the exam quickly, right? And I could be like, you know, my wife could have called me, I get distracted and I'm like, oh, it's B and it should have been A and I'm like, oh, well. I'll fix it on the, on the flip side. I don't know. I understand. Uh, it could have okay. also been like the wording. I think it was, I was thrown off by the wording. Yeah, now see what happened. It was me. No, and so what happens too, right? So, so here's a, um, a thing I, so I, I teach also at Manoa and mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, at Manoa, I will say this for them. They are really good cheers. They are really, really good cheaters. Like, um, so, you know, in principles, you know, 130 and 131, the class has about like 100 students. And I teach it online. And, um, you know, all my colleagues at Manoa are like super worried about like cheating. So they like make the exams proctored and, you know, they either have to come to campus to do it or they have to have like special software to do it. And like, it gets to be really expensive for the students. And then they look for like little clues to find students cheating. And then they like really take it to the extreme, right? Like, you know, hearings and all that kind of stuff. And they asked me what I did. And I was like, well, I mean, you might not really like me telling you what I do here, but I tell my students in that class, I'm like, you can work on the exam together for all I care. Like, and I heard they like use discuss and other things where like they're all working on the exam together, but they only yeah. have an hour to do the exam. So mm. like, you can just imagine like you get like a really talkative person or a person who, you know, questions everything that slows the entire exam down for everyone. Or the other okay. side of it is that, dude, I can also Google search, right? So like, I can also yeah. see what is Google going to tell you what the answer is. <laughs> so I remember a student, not that this is the case for you, but I, I remember a student um, like really telling me I was wrong. And I'm like, no, I actually changed the word. I know you think you see what I, what you thought you saw, but you just answered it based on what you saw on the web, not like what I actually asked. And I don't know. Um, but despite their, despite having it be like, I'm sure for many of them, a group exam and having full use of the internet, class average was still like 78%. So it's not like, I don't know. I don't know. It's cheating is just like one of the bad aspects of the job. Everything else is kind of fun, but um, I don't know. Um, okay, so we've got uh, four of us here, um, which is really sad. Um, okay, I'm not gonna. Okay. okay, so I am going to 
start this. Um, everyone can hear me fine? Yes? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And can you just see my Bloomberg screen coming up right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start talking then. Um, so this is, again, the free kind of talk, and then we'll get into the rest of the material. So basically, we're at about the halfway point, right? We've covered about half of the topics by this point, and we ended our discussion. I mean, in the first part of the course, we did kind of a review of things. We looked at how uh, GDP is um, constructed or output is constructed. We looked at inflation and how that affects things like the interest rate. We looked at um, the money supply and uh, we looked at um, inflation and we looked at the international, um, international economics, right? Things that you probably saw before in one way or another um, in um, principles. And so now what we kind of do is we start to look at things like the one thing that we still need to talk about that you would have seen before would be unemployment. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. That's topic six. And then in topics um, seven, eight, nine, and 10, what we start to do is we look at things like development. We try to look at um, fiscal policy a little bit, and then we wrap up things um, by talking about some of the Keynesian models and the other kinds of models. Um, if after next week, right, hopefully by next week, we have a little bit of a better sense of what the election um, holds. Um, a reminder for everyone, if you have a Tuesday class of any kind, that class does not exist because there's no class on election day. Um, the as I, as I indicated before, one of the kind of the unknown things here at this point is um, what is the fiscal policy going to look like after um, the election? I mean, theoretically, if this had been any year other than an election year, um, I don't know, my kid is getting so upset about a book. Uh, sorry, my wife doesn't get back with my other son until election or that's election and so after he's done with piano which is not for another half hour so i am multitasking um the if this was any other year other than an election year we probably would have had fiscal policy already but um what we're seeing now is an economy that's struggling to grow because it does not have the fiscal policy that's needed and unfortunately um, monetary policy really can only take the economy um, so far. Um, so with that said, big news came out today in two, um, in two numbers. Those two numbers would be GDP and um, GDP and um, unemployment. Uh, weekly jobless claims. So, um, well, can't, can't do it that way, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, when I do it with the iPad, my terminal functions don't work the same. And to do this class on a laptop is a lot harder than, um, it's easier to do this class on a iPad. Um, Okay, so let's look at this. Yeah, I see that, Pierce. Um, okay, why did I see it? Is your foot okay? That's okay, buddy. 
I'm to become that person where I kill my kid's buddy. Oh, jeez. Um, I don't know if it's a um, father to son thing where I call them buddy or Cody. What were you called as a kid growing up? Uh, I don't. I, I don't know. I guess buddy. I don't think I had a regular. <laughs> I should find something else to say. Uh, for. The women in the class that had brothers, or maybe you yourselves, were any of you called Buddy or your brothers called Buddy? Sorry, I'm killing maybe. time here while I look for what I'm looking for. We get like nicknames, like everyone gets designated a nickname. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, Same I'm here. good with that. But mine aren't that original though either, so I worry about that. Like Pierce is Piercy, and Truman is Trumi. I get called Channy. Like, that's my name. Okay, okay, well, I can't find this here. Okay, I'll just... Yeah. Okay, I can't find it here either. Okay, I'm just going to do this uh, a little bit simpler. Okay, so two stories came up today. Both of them might have someone thinking, wow, everything has come back and all is well again, but it's really not the case. So the first one here, we could, if I had more time and I had prepared a little bit more the data, um, I would have had a cooler looking slide for this, but um, we can do this just fine without it. Um, and that would be the GDP data. So the GDP data for quarter three, it obviously comes out four times a year. And before anyone gets super pumped about the number that came out today, oh, I see it, Pierce. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bear living in a house. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So this is GDP quarter over quarter. Um, Actually, no, I don't want that. I actually want something that shows it looking better. Oh, I'll help you, buddy. I'll help you, Piercy. There you go. It's supposed to be a bedtime story. That means you're going to fall asleep. Okay. So if you start to look at this data here, it shows that, uh, everyone can see my screen here? Yeah, the chart here, the level of GDP. Yeah. Okay, so um, in, the, in the Bloomberg, it would tell you even more specific data, but let's just take this picture from the Wall Street Journal, which by the way, Wall Street Journal, um, in the Bloomberg system, you have complete access, fully paid access two articles in the Wall Street Journal. So if any of you have business classes or anything where you need stuff like that, don't pay for a subscription. Don't just use Google News. Get it free from the Bloomberg. Um, so what we see here is that when the pandemic started to happen, right, you have that decline um, in starting in the second quarter of 2020, right? And that's that large dip there. And then we've got the increase. So the dip was historically large. Um, the decrease in the GDP, um, if my memory serves me right, um, was something like 25, 30%. Um, and now we've recovered a bit, as you see here. And the increase was 33%. And what the market expected was 32.5%. But what you'll notice here is that we have not, so someone running for office like uh, President Trump would say something like, oh, the economy is back. We've recovered 33, the economy grew 33%. If before you think that the economy is a third larger, uh, it's not. Um, and the reason why the economy um, is not a third larger is because um, it's growing 30, 
3% from what it was before as measured as if the economy was growing. Well, stop throwing books on your feet, kid. Yes, I will help you. I will help you. Sorry, class. Um, but for all of you who are working parents or aspire to be that, you will understand um, that it's not fair to your partner to put all child raising duties on one person. Um, it's not that it has to be equal, but it has to be uh, by choice what you're willing to take on. Um, okay. Um, when the economy grew, according to the data, 33% in the third quarter, um, that's as if it had grown at that pace for the entire year. So if we imagine what it was like on June 30th to September 30th, right? June 30th, the economy was just starting to open up again. Things are starting to resume. People are going back to work, legit work. Um, you know, people were getting their job back. And it was from nothing, right? Because everything was shut down more for the most part in quarter two. Well, it's not going to always grow at that pace. Like if you take it another way and you look at it another way, um, if you look at it another way, um, if it were growing, um, If we, were, if we were measuring it quarter to quarter, the rate of growth was 7.5%. So the rate of growth in the third quarter of 2020 was 7.5% greater than it was in third quarter of 2019. Okay, so that reduces a little bit more the, the rate of growth in the economy. But also what it does is it should give you a little bit of concern because if I go back to this chart here, and we look at what's happening here in the economy. I mean, look at what happened here. The yellow is second quarter of 2020, blue is third quarter of 2020. Obviously what we're seeing is that people weren't going to stores and now all of a sudden they are. People weren't, you know, going to the doctor. They weren't sending their kids to private school or tutoring. And now they are, right? Businesses start to build up inventories. People start to buy houses. Well, look at that. Look at the very bottom. State and local government spending, federal government spending. If anything, from all the things that I read, that is where we're starting to fail. So the thing is, is that everyone getting that 1200 bucks was fantastic, but most states in the United States, Hawaii included, have a severe budget deficit. And they also have balanced budget amendments, which means that they have no choice but to cut spending. When this is exactly the time they should be increasing spending. And right, I'm not a politician. I don't pretend to be a politician. I can be critical of politicians, though, and it escapes. And I, again, I don't care what your personal beliefs are. You can totally be, you know, the rightest right person. You can be the leftist left person. I don't care at all. And you should not care at all what I think, because one's political beliefs are not oftentimes formed by logic. They're just, I don't know impassioned beliefs you had in childhood maybe, or how shitty or how great your childhood was and your circumstances, I don't know, um, or your surroundings or who you're dating. There's so many things that make you, why you believe what you believe. Um, but I say that because I, I'm always amazed how in election years, um, again, I, I don't mean to be critical of Republicans particularly because Democrats also have their problems. But Republicans always seem to believe in being um, fiscally responsible um, in an election year, uh, when right now is exactly the time we should be totally deficit spending um, and not caring about that kind of thing. Um, trying to think of an equivalent 
um, criticism we could give of the Democrats to be balanced here. Um, I don't know. Democrats always seem a little bit more concerned about global warming in an election year than they do in other years. In other years, they don't really seem to care that much about climate change, except uh, in my opinion. Um, okay. So that the GDP data was one thing that came out that gives me pause for concern makes me concerned about the fourth quarter of 2020. And the reason why it gives me concern is because the expectation is that at that rate of growth in the economy, it's gonna take us until the end of 2021 to actually recover to where we were in December of 2019. So we actually have quite a long way to go to improve. Um, the other thing was um, unemployment numbers that came out. And I'm just going to look here and see if there is the data in the Wall Street Journal. If there isn't, what I'll say is um, the data told us that Um, I don't see it here, uh, but basically the initial jobless claims are still under a million, which is good. This is now the ninth consecutive week that um, the new people filing unemployment claims is less than a million, but the continuing claims, meaning people that are continuing to file for unemployment has been steady which basically means that people are continuing to um, be unable to find a job. Pierce, what the hell are you doing? Get off of that. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. How about I put you down here? Yeah? Uh, sure, kid. Okay. Ice cream. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm not trying to waste anyone's time here. I know it's 5.32 already. I'm not trying to say um, what we're doing here. they got to be that efficient. But the markets reflect this as well, right? So the markets were up today, but they were actually, for the most part today, um, um, really not moving a lot um, until the very final hour of trading. And if we look at the year to date figures here, we can see here, the meaning of this would be that the, uh, the uh, Dow Industrial, that's INDU, is still down for the year almost 7%. Um, that the Standards and Poor is only up 2%. Um, where things get um, a little bit crazier would be something like the NASDAQ, up 24% for the year. Uh, if you attended if you attended my Tuesday class, you would know why that's the case. Uh, Cody, why is that the case? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. No, you're fine. Why is the Dow Industrial average up only, let's say, a, was down about 7% this year, whereas the NASDAQ is up almost um, 24 to almost 25% this year. Well, the Dow is more, um, well, the, the NASDAQ is tech stocks mostly and the tech stocks- And which tech stocks dominant. specifically uh, are the big ones that we're talking about here? What's the big, the Apple? big four? Apple, oh, are we talking about FANG stocks? Is that in the NASDAQ? Yeah, exactly. The big, the FANGs within um, so Facebook, Amazon, yep. Apple, yep. Netflix, Google. Yep, exactly. And those are all driving this 24% return, right? And then you've got the crazy ones in there, like Zoom, Shopify, and all. I think Shopify is in NASDAQ. At least it probably you, should be if it's not. Explain the Dow better for me. Sure. The Dow Jones Industrial Average 
used to be um, it, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is is the oldest index out there. It dates back to 1888, 1887, 1889, something along those lines. And it's basically what's considered kind of like the backbone of the economy. Um, it is the oldest, not necessarily the oldest, but the best capitalized blue chip of blue chip, sto- blue chip of blue chip stocks. Um, so if we look at this, um, you know, what would be a classic example of someone that's in the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Um, GE, but like GE of old, right? Boeing, Caterpillar, right? I'm talking about big, largely industrial manufacturing kinds of companies. Um, now, that doesn't say that you can't have a company like Salesforce or something like that in it, but um, here's. I see where you're going. Now, in um, the terminals, you can just type in members, M-E-M-B, and that um, that Bloomberg um, in the go button um, in uh, Bloomberg, if you type in M-E-M-B, it'll give you the members of the, um, the um, index. Um, unfortunately, as many of you have heard, me say the, the iPad version I'm using here is unfortunately a little bit different, but so the um, Dow Jones Industrial Average cuts across the different markets, right? So um, NASDAQ is a market, Dow Jones is an index. Yes, Pierce, I hear you. Um, New uh, NYSE. New York Stock Exchange is a um, as a market, not an index. What an what an index tries to do is an index. Here you go, buddy. From from what I understood about the Dow was it's it's thirty companies that are thought to best represent the American economy. Yeah. But then, yeah. how does that differ from the S and P? So the S and P 500 is looking at the 500 um, uh, largest companies, largest by market capitalization. Yeah, I feel like so that. to be in the S and P 500, you just have to have a stock that's explosive in growth, whether mm-hmm. it's justified or not. Um, yeah. But if you look here again, as some of them, as I said, like. Caterpillar, Visa, Apple. These again are across different uh, markets. Honeywell, Disney, United Health, Salesforce, Johnson Johnson. So again, the reason why Salesforce was added to the Dow Jones was because there's not a lot of tech companies uh, like the fast, hot growing ones like a Zoom in the Dow Jones industrial average because it's not big enough. It's not classic enough so they had to they replaced exxon mobile right which was um you know oil prices are very very far down right they were negative at one point um late last year um so they got rid of exxon mobile because it was driving down the dow jones industrial average and they replaced it with salesforce that's probably the most controversial thing the dow jones industrial average has really done because I don't know much about Salesforce, but I don't consider it like the blue chip of blue chip, what it is that makes the American economy, the American economy. But they needed something there because going back to this, um, sorry, I want to go back to this is that these indices here are a business. Indexes are business because what you need them to do is you need companies to pay the huge membership fees to be a part of the index. And the reason why they do that, 
companies pay that is so that companies can get their share price up and people buying in those indices by doing things like buying an ETF that participates in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? Or the S&P 500, that would be the most classic one. Or NASDAQ, right? And so NASDAQ was super popular back in 1999 and 2000. It's now super popular again today. But that was not the case in 2003, right? NASDAQ would have been the thing you would have avoided. Just like today, for the most part, NYSE and the Dow Jones Industrial Average is being avoided today uh, because, as you see, again, it's down. So all the big money is crowding into the NASDAQ, um, right? So if I want a good NASDAQ ETF, that's where all the money is going, I would suspect. Does that kind of answer your question, Cody? Um, or not, not really? I... Mm, yeah, I guess it kind of does. I, I think. Does it I, raise another question for you? Mm, no, I guess what I was thinking was like, why would the Dow be the best representation for the American economy when everyone references the S and P as the growth of the American economy? Like, what is? Yeah, the Dow? No, that's a good question. So most ETFs. You know, most index funds track yeah. the S&P 500, not the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, yeah, when you watch TV, DGIA, Dow Jones Industrial Average, is the thing you see, right, yeah. that people talk about how many points it went up and down. That's what people talk about. So, yeah, you're right. There is this disconnect, you know, in terms of what do we as investors do, I myself included, you know, part of my retirement fund is just an index fund that tracks the S&P 500. Um, and the idea there is that you want to get the diversification that occurs across 500 companies. Mm. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is, as the name implies, heavy in industry, right? It's going to be heavy in manufacturing. It's going to be heavy in reflecting an economy that existed in like the 1960s. Because when you look at those companies of who we saw were the members outside of Salesforce, we're talking about like, again, Honeywell, Disney, you know, uh, Caterpillar, again, all the kinds of companies that we talked about with American greatness in the 1960s. But it's really hard to build a well-diversified index fund around just 30 stocks. Okay, Does that, that make sense? That, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. It's better at at giving information I'm about the American economy, but the S and P is better for investors. Yes, absolutely. And the members of the Dow Jones Industrial Average are also within the S and P five hundred. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, same with Nasdaq, right? Nasdaq, those companies would also be contained within the S and P five hundred to the extent that they are large enough. <laughs> What companies are holding back the Dow Jones, would you say? Uh, the biggest one would be Boeing, it would be my guess, not knowing really what they Boeing, I think, would be the best, my best. Um, I think that would be yeah, the biggest I one. That's we looked at it last class. Because Boeing, Boeing looks super okay. interesting as a stock because it's down so much, but I don't think they'll disappear as a company. So. So American Express would be driving it down, obviously, because financials are not doing well. Um, even Caterpillar. Caterpillar is overpriced right now, though. Pierce, why are you creating drama? Let's see what Boeing is doing here. I used to own Boeing, but I sold it for my down payment. Boeing was up so much, like a couple of years before. Oh, I know, I know. When it was like three hundred something a share, yeah. Um, I get that the airline industries are taking a huge hit, but Boeing doesn't only make airplanes. 
they make like defense technologies. They make. Uh, but it, there's a better plate. Wait, what are you? Are you interested in Boeing? I'm. I am, but I don't. I just want to. I I expect them to go up. I just don't know when that will happen. But why wouldn't? Okay, so let's do this exploration. Let's just sorry, and I'm not trying to delay us talking about something else. But I also happen to know that many of you take this class because you're actually interested as well in talking about financial things and stocks and things like that. T U V W X Y Z. God, wasn't that great? Claudia, when that was your priority, learning your alphabet? It really was. Good times. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, exactly. And you would think that our numbers, I mean, that's another one of like, uh, let's see here. Sorry, I was trying to look at something a little bit different here. I know how to do it on a traditional terminal, just not as well here. Where's your belly? Where's your nose? No. That's right. See, Claudia, that would be another one, right? You need to know where your nose was. Where's your ears? Yeah, that's right. Where's your eyes? That's right. Um, I'm going to go off my memory here, which is not a great thing to do here, but um, I can't easily find the data. So my, I, I can agree kind of, Cody, with what you're saying here, right? It's not just passenger airplanes, but it is the vast, when it's you buy a company, you really have to ask yourself, what am I trying to get the exposure to? If you just want exposure to all things in the sky, then this is exactly the kind of thing wow. company you would want to do. But then you have to take all the good things that go in the sky with all the bad things that go in the sky, right? And right now, the bad thing that goes in the sky is large commercial jets, right? That's the bad thing right now. Um, you can buy, like, a used, like, seven, I don't know, like, 757, I think, which is, like, an old plane. You can buy like a used 757 for like a million bucks, which is very cheap in the scheme of things because airlines are just getting rid of those things either because they need the money or the leasing companies are getting rid of them because they need the money. Um, uh, but if you want to do, for instance, let's just say the only thing you were interested in was commercial jets, then you don't want the other aspects of the business dragging things down. So then you'd be better off getting in something like Bombardier or even like Cessna or um, Dassault or even like Honda, right? Which makes Honda jet. Um, there's other ways to get that exposure. But if you're looking at the fence and that's the thing you're really interested in, then why wouldn't you do Lockheed Martin, right? Or if you're really interested in space, maybe you do right like spacex and you or sorry not spacex but you do the investment that um uh like virgin is doing and virgin galactic or even things like um uh what's the other one um uh elon musk uh what he's doing um with space too right so there's what i'm trying to say is that there's always better ways to get into um that space Space. Now, what the Bloomberg terminal would tell us, if I was actually in the terminal and not on the iPad, it would tell me what's coming from where. Oh, that's a pumpkin. Yeah, buddy. Um, I'm going to look at this analyst report here, right? And they're just talking about Gulfstream. Well, that'd be another one. Um, Ooh, Textron, too. That'd be another one. TXT, Textron, um, for that uh, defense exposure. 
but what I'm saying is that there's almost, if you're interested in a specific segment of the business, there's almost always a better way to get at it. Another example would be Caterpillar. Caterpillar sells a lot of different things, right? Just like John Deere sells a lot of different things. There's always a better way to get that exposure. Pierce, your mom is going to kill me for killing that pumpkin. No. Yeah, she will kill me. No. No, she won't kill me, but she'll be pretty grumpy. No. Okay, I'll put the nose back on the pumpkin, but you're the one that ripped it off. No. No. Sorry. Everybody? Okay, so um, I, Boeing, based on my initial like assumption on what the company was, like it, it makes plain yeah. that it was defense contract, yeah. but they're primarily yeah. the plane industry. That's why they took such a big hit. But you're saying if I wanted to get the exposure that I thought Boeing offered me, there are like Lockheed Martin, like here. Lockheed Martin would be, so let's look, okay, let's do that comparison, right? So here we can see for Boeing, how it's performed. Let's just look at its performance year to date. Is so Airbus year to date, okay. right? We can see started at 325 and it's now at 148. And we know the many reasons why it's at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So then if we look at Lockheed Martin, which I think is LMVH, I think, or LM2, sorry. Uh, right, starts at 389 and it's at 352. Largely reflecting the fact that, right, um, we still have enemies all around the world, but government budgets are gonna be a little bit more constrained because of all the other spending that they're doing. So, they're not going to be able to buy as many jets, right? Or, you know, fighting planes and that kind of thing. But you would have performed, if that was the thing you really thought was the future, you could have done this. Or, Bombardier. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think they got bought out by, no, they didn't. It's in Canada, though. I thought they went bankrupt. I guess they did. Wow. I'm reading it correctly. I haven't seen a share price like that ever. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's obviously reflecting the fact that people don't want, um, if, I think if I'm reading this right, I, and I don't really follow this company that closely because I just think it's, it's a very low margin business, just like passenger jets are a very low margin business which is the reason why I kind of rethought my strategy with Boeing. I was like you, I thought, okay, you can take the low margin business of passenger jets and augment it with the higher margin business of defense contracts. But why do you have to stick with that junk, right? Like why do you have to stick around with the low end side of the business? Just get a company that focuses on the thing they do well, right? Which would be Lockheed Martin makes things that like blow shit up, right? So like, you know, unless you're just like morally opposed to it, then you shouldn't have bought it in the first place. Um, in my opinion. Uh, Cessna doesn't even uh, list anything. <laughs> They'll probably make more money on the equity side of the business. Um, shows you how little there is in that business. I mean, the only other thing would be um, Airbus. So do you As think corporate bonds the European be markets? I'm sorry. Would corporate bonds be a, a good look right now? If I think Boeing will be successful when quarantines globally are not a thing, we would actually want them to be failing. Oh, I mean, because right now they've got they've I mean, got true getting... liquidity issues right now, right? So if we look at their bonds, this is when it comes due on. So I said this for my class on Tuesday, so my apologies for repeating this, Cody. But the way you would read this, the way you would do this in Bloomberg, is you'd start typing in the ticker symbol of the bond you're interested in, of the company you're interested in. So in this case, Boeing. So I start typing in Boeing, or I just typed in BA, and it would have come up with, as you would see here, let's just do it for Caterpillar. So I'd start to type in Caterpillar, which is C-A-T, but then if you scroll, or in the case of the terminal, you would see everything listed. You could see here that I can see Caterpillar, a 2.6% interest paying bond that matures on April 9th of 2030. Okay. Yes. 
What is going on? Buddy. Uh, this is a, a boring bond that pays 5.8% interest. That's like fucking fantastic, right? Comes due on May 1st, 2050. I'm guessing it was issued this year. I'm guessing. It was. It was issued in probably the worst part of the pandemic in April of 2020. So they must have really needed the money. Um, like I said, it comes due in 2050. And right now, people are paying 20... So the way you would read this price, just so everyone has a good idea here, what this is saying is that for every $100 of the bond note, you're paying $120. The reason why you would pay $120 for $100 of a bond is because that bond pays 5.8% interest. And as you all know, in this environment, um, oh shit, dude, look at this. It just got cut down almost to junk. Boy. So, I don't know. I don't know, Cody. It depends on how I think. I would wait till tomorrow if you're going to buy this bond or at least uh, wait until early next week. Well, I lost a lot today, so I'm, I'm, I'm good right now. <laughs> I want to get into that in the, for a little bit here. Um, geez. Okay, so here's just I want to give everyone an idea of what I'm reading here, um, just so I don't make this class like a pointless class here today. But they basically sold, looks like they sold new bonds today, in fact. But these are unsecured notes. Uh, so that means that there's nothing backing it up except the name of Boyne. And that is now at triple B minus. That is, as it says right here, is the lowest investment grade rating. Basically, that means is that there's nothing backing it up, and it's almost junk. When it's junk, that basically means the company has a pretty has a stronger chance of going bankrupt than um, most other big companies out there. Um, how big of a chance? Let's see. Pierce, buddy, you are killing me. I'm gonna get evaluations. Let's see. No. I only need one shade. Wow. Just class, not two. Mm. Okay, let's just. Eyes. Yes, eyes. Yes. 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 Um. That's crazy. Okay. So here I'm looking at the price of that bond since it was issued. So it was issued at the price of 100 when it first got issued because that was the issue price. And very quickly rose to a premium above that, primarily because the interest rate was cut by the Federal Reserve. And this bond was out here paying 5.8% interest. And I'm guessing here, is this a secured bond? I'm guessing this might be secured. Yes, Pierce. Buddy. Yes, buddy. Yes, yes. Killing me. Oh, it's unsecured. Wait. Uh, yeah, it's unsecured as well. Why is this price so very high still? Well, it shouldn't be. I mean, the best thing I can tell you is that it shouldn't be um, this expensive. Kid, you are killing me. Okay. 
if you were in my Tuesday class, you would know that I had found someone had asked me, what's the worst bond or what was exactly the question, Cody? I forget. What was the, someone asked me like, what's the bond that you could buy where like the cheapest bond you could buy or the most debt ridden bond or I don't know. Riskiest I bond out there. And I, I had made an educated guess of Zambia and we looked it up and Zambia had issued a bond. I don't remember which of the three it was here. This is picked a 2027 bond. Um, which effectively, this is an other extreme. The other extreme being this one is going to pay, you would pay $41 for a $100 Zambian bond. In paying for this, why would you buy a Zambian bond? Is because. Um, okay, can I write this back? You now will be getting your tuition dollars worth. And here, have something with that pack. And they also made something to show you. Okay. In this Zambian bond, let's just read this here. The country of Zambia will pay you 8.97% interest for a bond that comes due July 30th of 2027. You will pay, if I wanted to go in the secondary market and try to buy this bond, um, and you could, um, you could set up an account with Charles Schwab or Fidelity or something like that. And I think you're able to buy these bonds um, um, with no commission, I think if you buy government bonds, I don't think you actually pay a commission even. Um, but if you found someone out there who's willing to sell their bond, um, they will, um, the going price is $41 for a $100 bond for every $100 of the bond. Um, now, before you think that that's a great deal, the reason why it's forty-one dollars as opposed to Boeing, which was one twenty, is because the market generally thinks here that Zambia is not going to have the money. And if we look here, it's unsecured, so collateral, right? So it's just like house loans. Why are house loan mortgages interest rates so cheap? because there's an actual asset that backs it up, right? That the bank gets if you don't pay it, as opposed to a credit card. The reason why credit card interest rates are so high is not because credit card companies are greedy, although they are. It's because, dude, you went to the movies. <laughs> what are they gonna do? Is American Express gonna take its movie back? Um, so this is an unsecured debt issued by Zambia to basically pay its bills. There's nothing backing it up. They issued this in 2015. They issued $1.25 billion of bonds. And this, as you see with the ratings, is less than the triple B minus that Boeing has. This is junk. The only reason why you're buying this bond is because you want to make good money fast and get out of it fast. Um, there's no other reason why you'd buy this bond. Pension funds can still buy that Boeing bond. Triple B minus is the lowest rank of a bond you can buy um, if you're a pension fund or an insurance company. They are not allowed to buy junk like this. Okay. Anyone else? And while I'm on this, before I go into actual lecture, which I probably should have done earlier, is there any other market questions that anyone has? Even though this is not our primary focus of this course, you should ask it because I'm in the mood to talk about it. This would be totally your time to ask it. Do you think with a vaccine, like airline companies and Boeing will come back to their old highs? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, um, you know, with a vaccine and whatnot, is it going to, um, you know, are there certain pharmaceutical stocks that are better bets than others? That's really tough to say because now you're betting on, right? Like there are five companies, I think there are five companies out there. Um, so the way that we can do this um, in the Bloomberg terminal, you can type in CVID um, on the iPad, it's V-R-U-S. 
for virus. Um, I think. Um, so Johnson and Johnson has won. Um, what is it? Um, Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer. Um, does anyone know any of the others? I'm just it's escaping me a little bit here. What the? Um, Moderna or something? Oh yeah, Moderna. That's right. Moderna has one. Um, I was going to try to um, on the terminals. You can look, you can do it specifically with US cases, and you can actually break it down by state. Um, here we're just stuck. With, oh, this is just the US as a whole. So this is um, almost what here? 8.9 million confirmed cases. Dude, everyone's got it. Jeez. Um, it's just really hard to predict it because none of the companies, and I think there's like four or five companies, none of the companies have got anything yet at this point. So you could spread the risk, right, and buy something of everything, or you could take a really outsized bet, or let's go back to what Cody and I were talking about, right? You could buy Johnson & Johnson, right, which makes everything from like Band-Aids to this virus. And apparently, what from what I hear from people in the finance industry, there's a lot of big money going to this because Johnson & Johnson made that Ebola vaccine um and they're using that same method and process to do the one for um covid plus it doesn't require as much refrigeration as uh i think the moderna one does but the moderna one i think is like farther along in the approval process or maybe the pfizer one is farther along in the approval process i used to buy pharmaceutical stocks a bit more um, in the past, but it's really hard because the way that the pharmaceutical equities are built is that they basically have one breakthrough drug that generates almost all of their revenue. And then eventually, right, they lose that monopoly, right? And they get a generic and then they lose all that money, right? Because no insurance company is going to pay for the name brand when the generic exists. So then you're kind of like, you're having to take a guess of what does the inventory of non-approved but in the works drugs do they have and how good are they going to be, um, right? Like, I don't remember what company it was, but the one that owned Revenzvir or Redensvir, the one drug that they're using for um, COVID, I think it was owned by, was it Merck? Um, whoever owned it, right? how are you going to predict that shit, right? I mean, how are you going to like buy a, a pharmaceutical stock? And then you're just like hoping that you're going to get that like, um, you know, Bristol Myers would be another example. Like it's something I used to own. It's just, I don't know. It's like a lot of hurt. It's a lot of pain, right? Because you're just trying to like, you know, hope that they're breakout drugs maintain to be breakout drugs and that no one dies. It's just such a hard way to make a lot of money. And as you can see here with Bristol Myers, it's basically done jack shit. Um, now Johnson and Johnson's a little different because it's doing a bit more things, but it's not that fantastic over five years it's gained 37 percent i mean that's not that great compared to the rest of the market um pfizer pfe yeah i <laughs> mean look at that so i know it seems like cool to think oh man how much could i bank off the fact that one of these companies will come up with the virus vaccine but dude, it's just not, I mean, the day that the one hits, you're going to make a ton of money. You don't must be better off though, making the money on the companies that these companies buy from. Now that's the cool part that 
the Bloomberg terminals can tell you all about because you can look at who is the suppliers for Pfizer, right? Like what companies do they use to make their vials and to make their technology and to make their whatever there is that they're making, right? Just like for airplanes, you can say what companies do they use to build their engines? Um, For a grocery store, you can say, why should I buy Safeway um, when I can like buy from the companies that they buy from, right? Like how much do they buy from General Mills and Kellogg's and whatnot? Um, If you don't think there's a lot of money to be made in the equities, that's where you would then say, I can make it from the bonds. And almost always when you can't make money from the equities, you can almost find a way to make money from the bonds. So this would be Pfizer, a bond that comes due uh, in 2030, paying two and five eighths percent interest, paying 110, um, that would mean that the yield's gonna be pretty bad. Yeah, 1.3%, but you know that this company is not going out of business anytime soon. And you're basically going to make almost 10 times what first Hawaiian bank's going to pay you on a checking account in terms of interest, more than 10%, almost a hundred percent more. Um, and I'm going to guess this is double a I'm guessing. Yeah. Double a, so this is top grade investment grade bonds. You can make a solid living based off of this, right? You don't have to get breakthrough returns. You can go to sleep at night and know that Pfizer is going to pay its interest on this bond. And even though you're overpaying now and paying $110 for every $100 of the bond, despite that, you're still making 1.3% in interest, which is better than a savings account, better than a bond, or sorry, better than a um, high yield CD out there. Um, you can make and you can buy this commission free on Schwab or anything like that. I mean, fuck Robin Hood. I mean, you don't need to be buying the equities. You can make money on the bonds, in my opinion. Any other questions about this? Anything else you're interested in? Otherwise, I go right into the lecture, unless anyone says anything. It's all kind of pulling back right now. When do you think you think that's going to continue with the, all the election and everything? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, my wife asked me that question as well. Uh, the question being um, how to trade around the election. It's just a tough one because you really don't know. Um, all the scenarios out there are are such that you either the only great case scenarios are one where one party takes everything, right? House, Senate, and presidency. Because that gives you, you then you absolutely know what's going to go through and what's not going to go through, right? Because all the control, all the power is collected and you know the result. More likely than not, what you see next week is this idea that either you don't know the results or the results are mixed, right? One party gets one house, the other one gets the Senate and the other one gets, right? And one of them gets the um, presidency. And that mixed result gets to kind of what we've had the past uh, two years, right? Which is more or less nothing, um, right? Where the House stops what the Senate's trying to do. The um, Senate um, stops what the House is trying to do. And the president stops what the House is trying to do. And sometimes even what the Senate's trying to do. You get a whole lot of nothing. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe the only way you could really make it would be, I don't know, trading on the VIX, maybe. I actually haven't seen what's going on here the past. Let's just look at it over the months. This would be the volatility index. Uh, you're getting some enhanced volatility. So you could buy some options on the, on the VIX. I mean, that'd be about the best. Because you know that the next week is going to be volatile. Um, well, it's not as certainly come down over the year, but it's starting to ratchet up again. And it's also ratcheting up because, again, the stimulus that we had 
in the earlier part of COVID is now all run out and all exhausted. And so there is this general sense that the economy is starting to slow down unless it gets the additional stimulus. But these are complicated trades, trades that you will, if you do the trade right, you'll make a lot of money. And if you do the trade wrong, you'll lose everything. So you'd be more depressed than Cody today. Yes, Cody, what went, what went wrong for you today, Cody? Um, well, I'm, I'm only invested right now in Tesla, AMD, Amazon, Apple, and NextEra. And they all did not do well today. Is it they didn't do well or is it they didn't like blow it out of the park, right? Because they all had earnings, but my sense was that the market wasn't like totally super impressed. Mm. That was my sense. Um, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Let me check my Rob. So that was my, the sense of the market was that like, for instance, Amazon, Amazon beat on earnings, but the market was expecting even more than just beating earnings. I don't know, like blowout, super fantastic. Um, My average cost for Amazon was 3,200. So it, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so you get like a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Yeah, and I bought in at AMD at 81. It's now at 77. I bought it at Tesla at 407, which was cheap for yeah, Tesla. It's at 411. And it's at 406 yeah. now. Oh, yeah. On I just AMD, yeah. It's just not been a good week. Yeah, well. Uh, I haven't been watching what's going on in NextEra. Yeah, unfortunately, utilities are just not performing either. Like they should. Uh, but let's look. Let's look at Cody's problem and dilemma. What about the bonds? Look at that. I didn't see you buy this bond. Couple. You can buy this bond almost at par. And yield, you'll get 2.4%. And you know it's not going anywhere. I mean, you know the company's not going anywhere. Not that you want to wait till 2050 to get your money back, but um, might that be an alternative way of thinking about it? And it's relatively cheap right now. It is. It's very cheap. So the and you could buy the this. Is what, 2%? Yeah, a little over 2%. 2.4%. Annually. Annually. Yep. Now it's going to change based on the price, the going price of the bond, right? So it's going to change every day, but you're going to get, you're going to get two and a half percent as guaranteed by the bond instrument itself. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you sold this, or I'm sorry, if you bought this bond today, you're paying $100.36 for a $100 bond. So, right, this is going to be a little bit less than 2.5%, which it is, 2.48%, because you paid a little bit more in the price. Okay. Uh. So, I mean, if anything, class, I mean, I, and some of you might be, Stephen, you might be hearing this and being like, dude, I took this class because I wanted to learn macro, not because I wanted to learn trading. But, I mean, if, any, if, any, if anything, for everyone in this class, um, the thing I tried to push Tuesday and I'll push again today is that I, I know it's like the aspect of your generation to think that there's an equity solution to every financial problem, but you really shouldn't think that way. I mean, there are bonds out there that sometimes solve the problem that you're trying to, um, that you're trying to solve, It'll solve, the problem you're um, solve that problem. Um, same with options, which again are a bit riskier. But I think if you just try to think of everything that you want to buy in terms of equities versus bonds, think about what should I buy? Now, again, Amazon, 
what are you losing? Well, you're not going to get any, you're going to get some capital gains here, but you're not going to get a ton, right? Like you would, the growth prospects are all in the equity side. But if you wanted to, right, if your dad died and you wanted to give your mom a safe investment so that she could pay her property taxes, you don't want to give her Amazon the stock. You don't want to give her this bond, right? You'd use the insurance proceeds from your dad passing and you'd buy this bond because it's going to pay 2.5% interest, which is more than she's going to get by just opening up an account at Central Pacific Bank and putting it in checking. And this will do what it's supposed to do because this bond comes due in 2050. By that point, your mom will be dead, right? But at that point, the bond will have done what it's supposed to do because you'll earn interest and you'll use the insurance proceeds to pay her property taxes so she doesn't become homeless. And yeah, you're not going to, right, you, maybe 30 years from now, Amazon is going to be like, I don't know, $10,000 a share. But at the same time, it could also be $1,000 a share. Because Amazon has existed, yes, for 20 years. But at some point, it will be like Sears, and it will be like JCPenney, and it will be like, you know, Walmart, right? Or even like Target, right? Like who, I mean, people still buy things at those kinds of places, but, you know, people are going on Etsy and Amazon and other places to buy their stuff. But regardless, Amazon will still probably be paying this bond in 2050, even though I guarantee you, Amazon will probably not be the market leader in internet sales in 2050. And the share price will probably reflect that. Other questions? Nope. Okay, let's go to the actual lecture here. Okay. Um, we were talking about unemployment today. Um, sorry, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to... Stop the recording so that I can restart it.